Our second reading today from the New Testament comes from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except for this foreigner? Then he said to him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our next hymn can be found in the white insert in your bulletin. Just compassion and love. Come and bring light to our people in darkness. Come set us free from the chains we have made. We are your people, the flock that you tend. Lord, open our eyes once again. To the victims of violence, open our eyes. To the ones who seek justice, open our eyes. To those sitting in prison, our eyes. Teach us compassion and love. Come and bring light to our people in darkness. Come set us free from the chains we have made. We are your people, the flock that you tend. Lord, open our eyes once again. When our color divides us, Open our eyes when the darkness surrounds us. Open our eyes when we choose to look elsewhere. Open our eyes. Teach us compassion and love. Come and bring light to our people in darkness. Come, set us free from the chains we have made. We are your people, the flock that you tend. Lord, open our eyes once again. To those full of life's sorrow, open our eyes. To the needs of the lowly, open our eyes. To the ones who seek peace, teach us. 
lost compassion and love. Come and bring light to our people in darkness. Come set us free from the chains we have made. We are your people, the flock that you tend. Lord, open our eyes once again. To those suffering in illness, open our eyes. To those trapped by addiction, open our eyes. To those lost or forgotten. Teach us compassion and love. Come and bring light to our people in darkness. Come set us free from the chains we have made. We are your people, the flock that you tend. Lord, open our eyes once again. Open our eyes once again. Would you pray with me, please? Oh God, may these, my simple words, become light today for us, your people, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. A few weeks ago, I was leaving a meeting, walking and talking with someone I work closely with on many things here in the community. While we were talking and walking to our cars, Enid's Food and Resource Center, Loaves and Fishes, came up in our conversation. You might say that I have a vested interest in Loaves and Fishes. Not only does my wife Katie work there as the assistant director, but I've had the pleasure of watching Loaves and Fishes grow into what it is from its infancy. When I arrived here four years ago, I shared office space in this building with Loaves and Fishes before their building was complete. On top of that, on any given week, more than 50% of the members of this congregation are involved in the work at Loaves and Fishes, from shopping with clients, to cleaning, to greeting clients as they come in. This church is a proud financial sponsor of Loaves and Fishes because we believe in their work, their work of fighting hunger and feeding hope. What this person had to say to me about Loaves and Fishes was shocking, to say the least. They shared with me that while they understand what Loaves and Fishes is doing, they don't really support it because they know that people will take advantage of the system. For example, they said one day when they were driving by the pantry, they saw that the parking lot was full of big, expensive cars. And they asked me, they said, if somebody can drive a car like that, why do they need food assistance? They said they saw people coming and going from the building in nice clothes, talking on the newest cell phones, not really looking like they needed help. And our conversation ended with a real kicker. They said that organizations like this, they do one thing and one thing alone. They enable people. They don't help them to find jobs. They don't show them how to provide for their families. They keep people where they are. And this infuriated me. And it's, only, it's always the case that you think of the thing to say after the fact. 
and infuriated me because of the 2,304 households that Loaves and Fishes has served this year. Only 36% claim total unemployment. 24% of those households are either employed full-time or part-time. The rest are either disabled or retired. It infuriated me because of the 2,304 households that Loaves and Fishes has served this year, 51% have a high school education or better. A few, 3%, have completed vocational training, and 19%, 19% have finished college or graduate school. It infuriated me because while most of us assume that people will take advantage of the system, all the households that Loaves and Fishes serves they will visit the pantry on average only three times in 12 months. And on top of all of that, I was infuriated because the ideas and the judgments and the thoughts that this person had were based solely on what they saw one day driving by the pantry. Someone once said that seeing is believing. But you won't find that in the Bible. And I don't think it's ever the case. A few months ago, I started volunteering at Loaves and Fishes as a shopper helper. And that's one of the things that makes that organization different. When a client comes in, a member of the community walks through the pantry with them. Helps them shop, helps them load their cart, even will help take the groceries out to their car. It's a way to humanize and dignify the experience. Nobody likes to ask for help. So this is a way to put a face on something that is only a theory for most of us. That difficult situation of having to ask for help, it's eased when someone knows your name. When they want to hear and listen to your stories. When they know that you are a person, just as they are. I was blown away my first day as a helper. Because the first client that I helped was about the same age and disposition as my grandmother. Shopping with her that day and with hundreds of others since, I'm overcome with joy and sadness. Joy comes when I can help send somebody out the door with, on average, 150 pounds of free, nutritious food. But sad. It breaks my heart that in our world of extreme and bottomless wealth and prosperity, there are some who, because of their age or ability level or just the circumstances of their life, have to scrape and bend and even break to put a meal on the table. Having the chance to shop with someone who's hungry, someone who's depending on that shopping cart in order to survive, it puts a name and a face on hunger. Most of the people that I've met while volunteering there, and they are people, they're there because they really need help. Not because they blew their paycheck on a cell phone or a car or a pair of jeans. Sight, seeing, and the judgments and thoughts and ideas that come from what we see can be and usually are severely deceiving. Luke tells us that when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the place where he would be brutalized and murdered as a criminal, ten lepers approached him, and he saw them. He saw them. And now, if Jesus had acted towards these lepers based solely on what he saw, the story would have ended there. 
It would have ended there because leprosy, whether it was actually leprosy or some other common skin disease, it was a sign that God was mad with you. And people needed to stay away. The story would have ended because Jesus, as a Jew, would have been impure coming in contact with them, and he would not have been able to worship in the temple. The story would have ended because Jesus would have been afraid that the skin disease would transfer to him. And it would have ended there because on seeing the lepers and interacting with them, Jesus would have known that his reputation in Jerusalem would suffer because he was hanging out with those people. But that's not where it ends. The story doesn't end with Jesus seeing the lepers. The story continues. He says to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. As the ten lepers went and did as Jesus told them, they were healed. Now only one returned, and we've heard this story since we were children, and there's a lot to learn from that. But we have to wonder, why did Jesus interact with them? Why did he talk to them when so much was at stake? The truth is, Jesus spoke to the lepers. He treated them as human beings because he knew and he believed that beneath the scabs and the sores and the flaky skin was a person created in God's image. And as a bearer of God's image, those people deserved more, much, much more than someone looking at them, making a judgment, and then turning away. That's what Jesus did. His whole ministry was about recognizing the sacred worth of every individual and the love that that inspired. The lepers, the woman at the well, the Syrophoenician woman, Jairus' daughter, the 5,000 that sat on the hill to listen to him preach. It would have been easy for Jesus to turn away from the woman at the well because she was his ethnic and religious enemy. It would have been easy for Jesus to dismiss that crowd of 5,000 because they hadn't thought ahead and packed a lunch. Christ could have ignored Jairus. Jairus had nothing to do with Christ. But what we see in our Lord over and over again is one who sees who sees beneath the appearance and then acts to restore the abundant life God desires for us all. When someone is hungry, when they're suffering from a disease, when they're shackled with stigmas and shame they did nothing to deserve, Christ acts. He acts to restore the abundant life. Sight, seeing, it's not where it ends, it's actually where it begins. And the it is healing. It's restoration, it's transformation of the lives that we lead and the life of the world. The calling for us, you and me, who claim to follow Jesus is to enact and echo the same, to not just see and then turn away, but to see and then act. To act out of love for the sacred image of every person. When you see a person with dirty clothes and messy hair and dirt under their fingernails and a backpack slung over one shoulder, what do you see? Do you see an addict, a gambler, a person who has thrown their life away? Or do you see someone who's down, who might just be picked up with a meal, with a simple human interaction? When you see a man with fabric 
ceremoniously wrapped around his head, or a woman dressed all in black from head to toe, what do you see? Do you see someone who might be strapped with a bomb? A terrorist? A person who's bent on our destruction? Or do you see someone who is trying to live out their faith just as you are? When you're walking or running on the Enid trails or at the mall or at the high school and a black person approaches you from the opposite direction, what do you see? Do you see a thug? A criminal? A looter? A robber? Or do you see someone who is probably just afraid because of the color of their skin? Who knows that they could be targeted just for being black and walking? When you see a younger person walk into church or someone younger than you, what do you see? Do you see a commodity? Do you see someone who will take up your jobs because you're tired? Do you see someone who has to do it like we do or take a hike? Or do you see someone who's able to give as much as they receive? When you drive by a house with a Clinton Kane sign or a Trump Pence sign in the front lawn, what do you see? And what do you hear? And what do you think? Do you hurl at them the insults that you read on Facebook or hear on the news? Or do you see someone who, just like you, is struggling to make sense of a complex world? When you look at Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, what do you see? Do you see a weak revolutionary? Or do you see a humble savior who came to set you free? If we see Jesus like that for the humbleness, the gentleness, the love, the grace that he brought into the world, we will see as he does. We will act as he does. No more assumptions, no more judgment, no more turning away. Just seeing and doing holy things. The more I think about the conversation I had with my friend about loaves and fishes, the more I think I could have said. And I have to admit, I missed an opportunity. Like them, I turned immediately to judgment. And what I should have done is this. I should have said, come. Come and see. The next time I see them, I'm going to invite them to come and work with me at Loaves and Fishes. I'm going to invite them so that they can interact with the clients to learn about them and their circumstances. To not just see and then assume. This may be the thing that saves us. To move beyond what we see. To get to the heart, to the meat of every person and every situation. When the prophet Jeremiah and the Israelites were in Babylon in exile, God told them to do some crazy things. Build houses, plant gardens, give your children into marriage, make sure they have lots of grandbabies. Why? Why would we invest so much time and energy in a place that is not our home? Because the welfare of the Israelites was inextricably linked to the welfare of Babylon. So whether where they were living was in Israel or in Babylon, their wellness was fully dependent on the wellness of the city. You and I live here. We've come here for many reasons and for many different places. God asks for us in our daily living to invest in this community because our good is tied to the good of this city. So I pray that we'll move beyond what we see, that we'll slough off the judgments and the assumptions that we make 
so that we can take part in God's transformation of all things. And when we do that, when we take part in transforming the world around us, whether it's with food or politics or law or education or medicine, that's what we will be also. Transformed. So what do you see? I know what I see. I see a gathering of God's people, beloved and beautiful and messy and broken, redeemed by Jesus Christ and called to be light to the world. So let's do that. Amen. <laughs>